Mm -hmm. Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to four player game, Unmatched Adventures Tales to Amaze, designed by Jason Hager and Darren Reckner, and published by Restoration Games, who helped sponsor this video. Unmatched has traditionally been a competitive game where each set had you going head to head against your opponents. But here, whether facing the terrors of the Mothman or the alien attacks of the Martian invader, along with their hosts of menacing minions, you're going to have to work with the other players to survive in this cooperative twist on the original Unmatched system. Now, you don't have to own any of the previous Unmatched games as everything you need comes in this box. But these sets are all compatible, meaning you can bring characters from the competitive mode into the cooperative game and vice versa. In this video, we're going to assume you already know the rules to the competitive mode, which make up a good portion of the core rules here. But if you don't know those already, you'll find them in a separate included rulebook and in our separate tutorial that I'll have linked below. So go watch that if necessary, then come back here, join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, put the double-sided game board in the center of the play area. There's a side for each of the two included villains, but the Martian Invader villain, which is the side we're looking at here, is more challenging, so for your first game, they recommend facing the Mothman, as we'll do here. No matter which villain you're using, you'll still follow the next steps, but just switch out the related components. And there are a couple of little additional tweaks for the Martian Invader villain, and I'll show you where to find those adjustments in the rulebook at the end of this video. First up, you'll want to locate the villain's action deck. For the Mothman, it's the cards with this back. This is the Martian Invaders, so we can keep this one in the box. You now shuffle the villain's deck into a face-down pile. You'll also put its health dial nearby, set to a beginning value of 10 times the number of players. We'll assume we have two players in this video, so we set it to 20. Then put this threat marker on the first space of this threat track and the villain miniature on the value 5 starting space. In addition to the two possible villains, the game also comes with six different minions and you'll pick a number of these to use equal to your number of players, so two minions in this case. This can be chosen randomly by finding the initiative card for each minion, which will have this back, mixing them up and then revealing the required number randomly. Or you can just pick which ones you want to use. And I can tell you for sure, I'm gonna pick the skunk ape and let's also go with the blob. Now collect and shuffle separately the action decks for your minions, setting them nearby, along with their health dials, which you'll set to 10 each. If you're playing with the blob, as we are, you'll also create a supply of its acid tokens. If playing with the tarantula minion, it gains this supply of web tokens. Now collect the tokens for your selected minions, the skunk ape and the blob in this case, and place each, as you like, into its own empty space adjacent to the villain. Since we're playing with the Mothman, one of the special setup rules for this villain is that we also randomly place these four bridge tokens onto the outlined labeled bridge spaces of the board, ensuring that this destroyed bridge side is face down. You then set one of these doom tokens on the value one bridge. Now, which side you put face up doesn't really matter, but the red side thematically matches the Mothman's red eyes, while the other side matches the Martian invader. All the remaining Doom tokens you keep in a supply nearby. Each player now chooses a hero. There are four included in the game, and in this video, we'll pick Annie Christmas and Dr. Jill Trent. You'll find a set rules document that explains the unique features of each hero that you can refer to when playing. You'll otherwise set up each hero using the regular unmatched rules, as I've done here, adding their miniatures and sidekicks to the board. These are the order markers, and each player now collects the one matching their starting space value and puts it in front of themselves. You also go through this initiative deck and collect the ones matching the player order markers that were taken. So one for player one and one for player two, along with the initiative cards for the villain and minions in your game. Shuffle these into a face down deck nearby and return the rest to the box. If you happen to be using the Ant Queen or Loveland Frog Minions, their initiative cards look like this and would go into the initiative deck during setup. However, the Ant Queen also has these three extra initiative cards and the Loveland Frog has these. Their initiative cards are still shuffled into the initiative deck, but these aren't. You would instead keep these nearby to be added to the initiative deck when the game instructs you to. And that's the setup. 
In Unmatched Adventures Tales to Amaze, you and the other players will be working together to defeat the villain. Although there are also minions terrorizing the board, you only have to defeat the villain itself to win. And you do this by reducing its health to zero. As players, you lose if all the heroes and all of their sidekicks are defeated. You also lose if the villain achieves its objective four times. For the Mothman, that means if it destroys all four bridges on the board. Again, remember, we're not going to teach the rules to competitive unmatched, which explains how you take actions and play cards. For those rules, you can check out the tutorial we have for that, linked in the description of this video. But we will cover the unique rules related to this mode of play. Here the game is played over a series of rounds, broken into several turns each. At the start of a turn, flip the top card of the initiative deck and set it into a row. This will tell you whose turn it is. In this case, player number two. This is the person with the order marker showing that value in front of them. So Dr. Jill Trent in this case. The initiative card will usually have a right now effect that is resolved right now. In this case, we're told that player two takes a turn. After their turn is resolved, you reveal the next initiative card, adding it to the right of any other revealed ones. Resolving the right now effect of this card means the skunk ape now takes a turn. Some cards have an end of round effect, which is shown in this area. That effect will only be resolved at the end of the round, after all of the turns have been taken, so it's ignored for now. So again, after each card's right now effect is resolved, a new one is flipped from the initiative deck, added to the row, and resolved. In this way, the order that players and enemies take turns will be randomized each round. When a player is taking their turn, they resolve it according to the normal unmatched rules, performing two actions, picking from maneuvering, scheming, and attacking. The only player action we need to discuss is attacking, since you no longer attack other players, but enemies on the board instead. When attacking, play an attack card face down on the table as usual, and then play the top card of the enemy's deck face down as its defense. Both are then revealed and resolved. The enemy's defense value will be shown with the shield symbol seen here, and if there's an effect in the same area as the defense symbol, as we see in this case, then it's resolved at the indicated time, in this situation, during combat. In a case like this, the effect is only associated with the attack value. Here the defense is in its own separate area, so no special effect happens when the enemy defends with this card. As usual, if a player's attack deals damage, reduce the enemy's health dial, and then resolve any after-combat effects that might apply. After, put both played cards into their respective discard piles. If you defeat an enemy, remove its miniature or token, health dial, and all of its cards from the game. If its initiative card is currently revealed in the initiative row, remove it from the game. If it's not, let's say, for example, it was still in the deck, then when it does get revealed, you remove it then, since that minion won't be taking any more turns. In this way, after defeating a minion, you won't have to deal with it anymore. That said, if you defeat the main villain, the Mothman in this case, you just immediately win the game. Also keep in mind, players can discuss strategies openly and even play with their cards face up on the table if they like. Now, unlike players, enemies don't have a hand of cards. They have their deck. So an effect that reveals or would allow you to examine cards from the enemy's hand instead lets you look at the top card of its deck. So even if you'd be allowed to examine three cards, you just look at the top card only and then after set it back. On the other hand, if an effect forces an enemy to discard, put the required number of cards from its deck into its discard pile. Also be aware, effects that target heroes or sidekicks never affect the villain or minions. But effects targeting fighters can affect enemies as normal. Okay, with that, we've learned the new rules for player turns, so let's look at enemy turns. When an enemy card is revealed and it's instructed to take a turn, it doesn't perform two actions the way a player does. Instead, it will first pick a hero or sidekick as its target for that turn. If the enemy is adjacent to one hero or sidekick, it picks it as its target. If more than one hero or sidekick is adjacent, the players decide which of them the enemy will target. If no target is adjacent, then check the enemy's move value shown here on its initiative card. So three for the skunk ape. The enemy will now move to attack the closest target within that distance 
that it can reach. If there's more than one route it could take to get to the target, it will always take the shortest route. If there's a tie for the closest target, the players decide which of the targets the skunk ape will go after. So let's say any Christmas was here. Now, both of these are two spaces away from the target. Let's say we decide that the skunk ape will go after this sidekick. If there's more than one shortest path to the target, in this case, the skunk ape could either go one, two, this way, or one, two, this way, then the players will decide which path the enemy takes. And keep in mind, enemies can move through other enemies, but not through heroes or sidekicks. If there's no target within the enemy's move value, the enemy doesn't move or attack. Instead, advance the threat marker by one. You do this by moving it one space to the right. We'll come back and discuss the importance of the threat track in a moment, but for now, let's finish resolving an enemy attack. Remember, on its turn, it picks a target. If it can move adjacent to it, or was already adjacent to it, it attacks. And be aware, an enemy only attacks, at most, once on its turn. When an enemy attacks, place the top card from its deck face down on the table. Then the defender may choose a valid defense card from their hand if they want, putting it face down as well. You then reveal both and resolve them. It's important to realize that every enemy card will have an attack and defense value, so each one will have a valid use when revealed. As usual, resolve any effects that apply, and after combat, put each card in its related discard pile. The blob has effects that place and also cause it to benefit from acid tokens. During the game, a hero or sidekick that enters an empty space with an acid token will take one damage. But they don't have to stop moving. If they have additional movement and want to keep going, they can. However, a hero or sidekick moving through an acid space that already has a friendly figure in it takes no damage. Although we're not using the tarantula minion in this game, it has web tokens that it can place. A hero or sidekick entering a space with one must end its movement there, but could move again after using a new action or effect. And like acid, a hero or sidekick ignores the web if a friendly fighter is already in that space. Just keep in mind a space can have, at most, one token of each type, and once placed, those tokens cannot be moved or removed. If an effect would place a web or acid token, and none of these are left in the supply beside the board, then just ignore that effect. Also be aware, enemy pieces are never affected by acid or webs. Okay, with that understood, I want to point out an important detail. We saw that when attacking or defending, the enemies draw cards from their decks. But what happens when one of their decks runs out? Well, they can't run out. Not exactly. Each enemy has what is known as a deception card in its action deck, and whenever this would be put into the enemy's discard pile, for any reason, you shuffle that discard pile along with this card back into its deck. And this effect of reshuffling the deck when a deception card comes out cannot be ignored or canceled or prevented in any way. As a further example, let's say I was in combat with an enemy, and after we'd both revealed our cards, my card and the enemy's card from the top of the deck, if my effect said that the enemy had to further discard another card, and perhaps use its boost value in this attack, then if the discarded card was the deception card, you'd use its boost value as normal, and then, in the middle of combat, since this is going to the discard pile right now, you pause, and it gets shuffled right then, along with the discard pile, back into the enemy's deck. The card that the enemy is using in the current combat isn't shuffled in. It will still only get sent to the discard pile after combat. With combat understood, let's discuss player elimination. A player is only eliminated once all of their fighters are defeated. If your hero is defeated, but you still have your sidekick, you still take your turn as usual when your initiative card is revealed. Only once all of your fighters are defeated are you out of the game. At that point, you remove your initiative card from the row if it's already revealed, but if not, you just remove it when it is revealed later. Either way, the remaining players will continue on in an effort to win. With that understood, now let's go back and learn about the threat track. When instructed, effects may cause you to advance the threat marker, moving it to the right. The current threat level is the value printed directly below the marker, and certain effects, like the one we see on this card, may refer to the threat level. 
If the marker reaches the end of the track, the villain achieves one of its objectives. In the case of the Mothman, destroying a bridge. The Martian Invader has its own threat track and objective on the other side of the board. Either way, after resolving this effect, which we'll discuss in a moment, no matter how far the threat was meant to advance that turn, you instead just return it to the first space of its track where it will advance the next time threat is affected. With that understood, let's learn about the bridges and the special rules related to the Mothman. The bridge tokens on the board connect the two spaces they sit between, allowing pieces to move between them as normal. The bridge itself is not its own space, and you don't count it as you move, and you can't end a move on it. Effects in the game can place Doom tokens onto bridges, and a single bridge can have up to eight Doom on it. If an effect would place Doom when there isn't any in the supply, then you instead advance the threat marker one space for each token that couldn't be placed. Although bridges can collect doom, which is bad, they have benefits as well. After a player completes a maneuver action, they may discard any card they're holding to activate the printed effect on a bridge adjacent to any of their fighters, even a fighter that didn't move during that maneuver action. That said, you can only activate a single bridge per action. So if you have more than one fighter adjacent to a bridge, just pick one of those bridge effects to resolve. At the draw bridge, you choose a player to draw cards until they're holding four, but they can take fewer if they like. At the covered bridge, pick a fighter and they recover up to three health, but you can't use this to bring back a defeated fighter. At this truss bridge, you choose an enemy or friendly fighter and move them up to three spaces. Here at the suspension bridge, you pick an enemy still in the game and look at the top two cards of its deck, discarding one and putting the other back on top. Remember, to resolve a bridge effect, you must discard a card from your hand. But resolving the effect of the bridge is optional. After discarding, whether you resolve the bridge effect or not, you may then remove a number of Doom tokens from the targeted bridge equal to the boost value of the card you discarded, putting them back into the general supply. Now keep in mind the Mothman's objective is to destroy bridges. And when the threat marker reaches this space, it destroys the lowest numbered bridge on the board, no matter where the Mothman itself is located. Each bridge has a value printed beside it on the board, so this is the lowest valued bridge, and it will be destroyed first. When a bridge is destroyed, first move all of the Doom tokens on it to the next lowest numbered bridge, so bridge two in this case. Then go back and remove the destroyed bridge and put it face down on the leftmost empty space for destroyed bridges beside the threat track. You then resolve the two effects connected to the bridge token that you just placed. Finally, move the threat marker to the first space of the threat track. After a bridge is destroyed, the spaces that are on either side of it are no longer considered connected, so you can't move or melee attack across them. But ranged attacks can still target disconnected spaces as long as they share the same color, just like ranged attacks normally work. If all that's not bad enough, as soon as the Mothman destroys the fourth and final bridge, the players all lose. With that, we now know the rules for taking turns as players and enemies. Just be aware, some effects can cause an enemy initiative card to be placed at the bottom of the initiative deck, meaning that it will eventually be drawn again that round, giving that enemy another turn that round. If an effect would do this during the very last turn of a round, let's say the Mothman's card was instructed to go back into the deck, well, there is no deck, but you can imagine it would go there and then immediately come back out again and get that extra turn right away. Now that said, once all of the initiative cards have been revealed and turns completed, you resolve the end of the round. Here you start at the far left card and one at a time go through them resolving any printed end of round effects. You then shuffle all of the initiative cards together into a new initiative deck and start a new round drawing the top card. Rounds will continue until either the players all lose because the villain achieved its objective four times, in the case of the Mothman destroying all four bridges, or because all of the player's fighters are defeated, heroes and sidekicks. Instead, the players win by defeating the villain, which is done by reducing its health to zero. And remember, you don't have to also defeat the minions, just the villain. When you're ready to take on the Martian Invader, flip the board over to this side and use its special components as described here in the setup and following its special rules. 
You'll also find instructions for adding unmatched fighters from other sets to your cooperative adventure, and rules for using this amazing event deck, which can be included for even more challenging gameplay. But all of those rules I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Unmatched Adventures Tales to Amaze. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.